Today, I am so excited to be joined by Isabella, the founder of PT Den. Hi, Isabella. And Demafia, the co-founder of Daphine. And we are going to be discussing the keys to building a cult brand on social media. Hi, girls. Hello. Thanks for having us. Hi, thank you for being here. So my first question, Isabella, I'm going to come to you first. Tell me a little bit about starting Peachy Den. How did you go about it and what did you feel was missing from the, from the market? Peachy Den um, began as a side hustle. Um, so it was had very slow and organic beginnings. I didn't have a formal education in a design background. So I really had to kind of dig deep and um, learn how to make a garment. So we started locally. I put up posters in my local town in Leicestershire and uh, for the lookout for a seamstress and pattern cutter. And then I kind of went to my um, wider circuit friends um, to find, to source a fabric supplier for velour. So luckily my auntie had a friend who knew a velour supplier. So once I had my fabric and we sourced a um, seamstress in our local area, we were able to create our first samples. So I started with a really small budget of 1,500. And once I had created my samples, I was then able to sell these um, through a website, which I also built through Squarespace, just using a template, and then got my friend to um, do the branding. So it was kind of humble begin- beginnings. And once I'd sold my first 50 pieces, I was then able to put that money back into the business and kind of grow organically, as I mentioned. Um, in terms of what was missing, we well, I felt that there weren't enough brands making trousers that fit really well um, using stretch fabric. So jumpsuits and trousers, which were comfortable, but sexy at the same time. So we, we designed for everyday life. So comfort kind of underpins each of our um, uh, designs and it's super integral to us, um, but not at the expense of feeling your best and, and feeling flattered. Amazing. Thank you, Isabella. And Demacia, tell me a little bit about starting Daphine and how you went about it. And again, what you felt was missing from the from the jewellery market. So quite similar to what Isabella said, for us, it was started from, um, you know, basic need that we felt was missing. So my business partner, Philippine, and I, we were, you know, discussing how we couldn't find just classic beautiful, timeless pieces like our mothers and grandmothers grew up wearing at attainable pricing. Um, And it all started with some gold bangles, um, which became one of our best sellers. So the story goes that the gold bangles um, were passed on from generation to generation in um, in Philippines family. Um, So for every milestone birthday, they would get a gold bangle. And then when it came down to Philippine, the price of gold had skyrocketed. And she's like, where are my bangles? And you know, we were discussing that, you know, that we had, you know, these types of like, you know, beautiful jewelry that we would see, um, you know, the women in our life that we aspire to be like, you know, our moms and grandmothers and aunties and all that wear, and then we just couldn't really afford it. So it just started from that, just, you know, a hole in the market. Um, I come from a background in branding and marketing and Philippine comes from a, brand, um, a background in fine jewelry. So we just kind of like both came together um, and then started started Daphne. Also, you know, very much with low budget. Um, we created our first samples um, and our suppliers just trusted us that we were gonna go ahead with it. So it didn't um, charge us really until we actually placed the order, which was you know a huge help for us because we had nothing really in the beginning to, to help launch the brand. And um, we also created the website um, on Shopify the logo was actually created by my mother, um, that she has a background in graphic design. So everything was just very homemade um, from, from the beginning. And I think like we, we've liked to keep it that way, even to this day. I think, you know, we're quite um, still small minded. Um, and when it comes to like the approach of, of growing the brand, we like to still keep it quite like, um, yeah, family driven and, and just, very natural, I would say. 
that's great to hear thank you guys and in terms of instagram peachy den has a huge following as does daphine isabella i'll come to you first how do you approach posting to instagram do you have a really strict social strategy that you don't really veer away from or are you quite ad hoc with it and you kind of post as and when how do you work that out um yeah to be honest we don't actually have a plan and we do operate more ad hocly but this is something that really we're really striving to improve and now we're doing monthly drops we have monthly shoots so we're trying to go to the shoot with more of a plan of like what content shall we get from the shoot and how can we diversify it to use across different platforms and if we're using it on the same platform say Instagram how can we make the content different so you're kind of giving your followers something more interesting rather than just churning out the same campaign images um, and in terms of we actually are looking more towards TikTok as well at the moment and it's been amazing for us in terms of just getting our brand name out there and then also it's definitely had an impact on our Instagram followers as well um, so we make sure when we go to a shoot, we're now taking more video content to use on TikTok and then obviously more stills for Instagram and then reels as well, which we haven't quite started. But I think, yeah, I think, it's, I think because our customer is kind of split Gen Z and millennial, we have to make sure that we're kind of touching both channels. Um, and obviously we like we're learning every day and there's still so much for us to learn but that's yeah, a process and have you found that the millennials will be more swayed and interested on Instagram whereas like you said TikTok is more for kind of Gen Z to tap into what they're doing yeah yeah exactly I don't know have you spent much time on TikTok I actually don't but when I go on it I find that I just get stuck in a black hole I just can't really get out of it because it's just so addictive but I also know all of the beauty and friends that are coming out through it and actually you see stuff and you're like oh wow it's all very like um 2000s and nostalgic um mm -hmm. Demacia how does Daphine a how do you guys approach social media are you kind of doing the same do you have a really strict plan so no, not really. For us, it's just very intuitive. Um, and I think from the beginning, we wanted to feel like there's, you know, an actual person behind the brand and not feel like a corporate brand that everything is just so planned out with posts that are always looking the same. So for us, I'm the one that still manages social media. It's been a hard one to kind of let it go. I know it's getting to that point that I am getting a little bit, you know, burned out by it. So um, I think it is the natural next step to have somebody give me a hand. Um, but I think it's just quite intuitive. When I feel like posting, I post. Um, it's very community driven. So, you know, if people are tagging me in some pictures that I think are relevant um, to, to the brand. I'm, you know, we love reposting and kind of like sharing um, other people's content as well. Um, like right now I haven't posted probably in six days, seven days. So it's like, I'm going through a little bit of a dry spell with Instagram, but just cause I, I I'm just not really in the mood um, to, to post at the moment. So I think it just kind of goes through waves um, in a way it is like an extension of, of, of us, of Philippine and I. So, you know, if we're feeling quite happy and joyful, we're going to be posting more often, you know, you know, with the pandemic, things just being a little bit more like slow, you know, we've been a bit more slow. So I think it's just a reflection of, of what we're feeling, really. Um, we do have some apps that, you know, we, we get the, we, we like to have the content that, you know, we, we know that we're going to probably post that works color wise, but by no means is that set in stone. Um, yes, so I'm most likely going to be posting something later today. <laughs> just because I haven't posted in a while but yes it's really it's really just intuitive and community driven and and as I said I just like to feel like there's someone behind the brand and it's not just a community manager um just like dictating and having everything like look so perfect all the time because um mm. I think that doesn't really resonate that well with people um I think you know when even like when captions or when stories just feel a bit more raw um we see more engagement with that too um, whereas when things are just like so picture perfect and like photoshopped, um, we don't see engagement. So I think, you know, the more natural, the more, the more human um, focused, uh, yeah, it just, it just resonates with us. And I think it resonates with, with our audience as well. 
So with that being said, Damasio, I'll, I'll come to you with this one first. What do you think is the one secret that you wish you'd known about social media that you didn't at the start that you do know now? Um, well, I, th I think just the fact that just social with social media, I think one of the difficulties um, for me personally is the fact that it's 24 seven. Um, so I think from the beginning, I thought it was just going to be a bit more like part of my day job, just like posting. I, I came into Instagram a bit naive. Um, my personal Instagram is, you know, quite private. I don't, again, post that often. So I think it was good that I came to it a bit more naive because I think I would have been a little bit too overwhelmed um, from in the beginning. But I think, you know, it, it is, it really is a big community. And I think if you know how to, um, who, who the people, um, that are connecting with your brand are, how to speak to them um, with influencers as well. You know, we've had a huge, um, you know, support from it, from a lot of influencers. And I think it also has to do with the fact that we are a small brand that just, you know, we're just normal, like we're natural, you know, there's, you know, the, the approach that we have to things just is in a very, um, yeah. I guess like organic way. I think from the beginning, I would have liked to know, just going back to your question, um, that just be yourself um, from the beginning. And I think people are gonna connect well with something that just has a heart and soul. <laughs> That's lovely. And Isabella, the same question to you. What's the social media secret weapon that you wish you'd known about when you started Peachy Dan? I think what really worked for us is working out what content um, really resonates with your audience, whether it's UGC carousels or it's inspiration or it's fluffy animals, working out what your audience is reacting to and making sure that you are posting lots of that kind of content. Um, another thing that's really helped with our growth is competitions. Um, in terms of if, if you want quick growth, it's, it's really beneficial. But at the same time, I wouldn't abuse it and I wouldn't do it too much because I think it can make your brand lose authenticity. Um, and then I suppose in terms of like what I'd wish I'd known at the start is I think Instagram is sometimes almost underrated in terms of what it can do for your business and how powerful a tool it is. And I think if you do have an authentic idea that you're super passionate about, I think you can start super slowly and you can just plant a seed and and take baby steps um, to really like, yeah, showcase your idea and, and promote something amazing. And you can find out pretty quickly if your product is gonna be a success through Instagram because it can really just fly if it's gonna, if it's a great product. So I think, yeah, I wish I'd kind of maybe just had a bit of a like push to do it because I was quite hesitant at the beginning. Um, I wasn't really, yeah, I lacked confidence. And same when I went from part-time to full-time, I really was super nervous, um, I think. And what's the hardest thing? I don't want to say the worst thing, but what's the hardest thing about knowing that you have a big following on social media and that your brand success has been kind of a result of, of that following? Isabella, I'll come to you first with that one. Mm-hmm. Um, I think probably the sheer amount of DMs we get. We're a customer-led brand, so we make sure that we do reply to all of our DMs. But at the same time, it can be super overwhelming. And I think work-life balance is blurred. The lines are blurred. I obviously carry my phone around everywhere. Sometimes I can literally be on the phone to DPD at 7 p.m. on a Saturday trying to find someone's parcel because they're so upset because they haven't got it for an event or whatever. So I think... In that sense, it can be difficult, but I'm so grateful for our customers and like, I wouldn't have it any other way. Like I'm happy to do that, even though sometimes it gets overwhelming. And Demacia, what's the, what's the hardest part about having a big following for you at Daphine? Yeah, I think it'd be actually the same thing. I think the fact that you can't really disconnect from it too much. Um, the, we also are very, um, you know, customer driven um, brand and you know the messages we get sometimes can be quite exhausting I think you know on the weekends I'm the one getting back to all the messages and when I see you know a DM of someone saying like you know I received the wrong product or whatever it is that you know happened 
Um, I just like, cannot um, stay away from it. It's quite addictive, I would say, when you post something as well, just to see how it's performing, um, you know, when someone reposts something. So I think like the addiction behind it is, can get quite, quite tiresome. Um, but other than that, it has been a wonderful tool for us. I think, you know, if it wasn't, um, if it wasn't because of Instagram, I just don't think we would be where we are at the moment. So we are, you know, quite blessed um, to have that platform. Um, but yeah, I think you just need to like learn to put the phone down. And if it's a few hours, you know, it's, it is fine that you can um, just take a bit longer to get back to people. <laughs> but yeah, it's just something we have to learn to, to, to deal with and uh, balance out. And what, Demacia, I'm particularly interested in this one for you, what um, impact, how much of kind of Daphne's success do you feel comes from the influences that you've tapped to get involved with Daphne, particularly when it was still kind of starting out? Well, yeah, I think for us in the beginning, the, the influencer push was, you know, was quite massive and huge. We had, you know, one ring that we, that we came out with, um, we launched the brand in June 2018. Um, and then just a few months later, just kind of skyrocketed and took off. Um, I think like with, with the whole influencer community, as I said, I think they're just what we've experienced, they're happy to just to support small businesses and a product that they believe in. Um, so I've seen tremendous, you know, outpour. And, and for us, it has been something that has really like taken us to the next level. Um, what I would say is, you know, from the beginning, we just kind of like in a way like worked with a few with a few influencers so we really got to know them as people too so you know we met them we went out for coffees and it just like became like an extension of our of our, of our brand in a way so I think it, you know we didn't want product just to go out to everyone I think we really made it a point to to basically grow with um the the actual like influencers that inspired us and we thought we were an extension of the brand in one way or another um and and yeah and like we still follow that philosophy to this day um so i think that we really do like to um to work with whether it be like content creators or influencers whoever that we really do think that are sending the right message out um and you know share the same like values that we do um but yeah it's been it's been a, a huge part of of our um, of our success for sure, especially in the beginning. And Isabella, what's Peachy Den's approach to influencers, and how are you how are you treating that? So for us, we um, are trying to really build those relationships with girls that really identify with the brand, and that we feel like we can have a partnership going forward. So regular gifting, whose content really fits in with our aesthetic and we're beginning to identify those girls and it feels amazing because we've really we're building personal relationships and we just know that the content will be great and also you can there's a bit more I feel like leeway in saying we we need this content in a week and it, sometimes you'll gift and then you'll never get something back in return and I think if you're really building those personal relationships you know that you will be getting that content and it will fit in with your feed and your aesthetic and I think that's super important and I don't think I realized that for the first year and a half I was just gifting girls that I really looked up to rather than trying to build those relationships so I would really recommend that to smaller brands and even micro influencers, they can be small. You can start small and, and it will be a success if you really find your girls who believe in the brand. And out of curiosity, just in case somebody's watching and thinks, oh, I wanna do that, but I'm not sure where to start. Where did you start, start by looking for girls? Were they people that you already followed or did you, how did you go around about finding them? Um, yeah, I think it was girls that I already followed, but also looking at brands that you look up to. Um, I think like, you know, massive brands, they'll always be working with incredible influencers who have incredible engagement rates, um, who 
yeah, who can sell your product. So I think starting there and looking at brands that you look up to, and then also feel like obviously the brand is an extension of you. So you should be for, like wanting to work with girls that you look up to and you love their style. So I think it's a bit of both. That's great. And my final question for both of you today is what advice would you give to somebody who has just started their brand or is just about to start their own brand and they're struggling with Instagram and TikTok and social media? What would you say to them? Demetri, I'll come to you first with this. Um, I think just going back to what I was saying before, just keep it really natural, keep it real. Um, for us, it's been key from the beginning. I think imagery is also really important too. Um, whether it be... You know, you don't need to necessarily like invest in like really expensive photo shoots, but have something that feels a little bit more, you know, put together. Um, and then you can mix that with a bit, you know, with more natural pictures or images that you're taking. Or I think a, a sense of professionalism, um, I would say, is key from the beginning. I think you also end up believing a bit more in the brand and in yourself when you see images that are um, a bit, yeah, a bit more thought out. Um, but definitely also keeping in mind, you know, who, who you want your community to be, because I think it is difficult from the beginning knowing who you're targeting, but keep that in mind. Um, look out for brands that you think um, are, are relevant to you, see what they're doing. We're constantly looking at other brands that, that inspire us. So um, from, from a bit more of like a branding strategic point of view, I just think like, you know, keep on looking at the future, um, believe in yourself, but also figure out who it is you want to tap into and what those needs of, um, of, of yeah, of that audience are. Um, As I, what I touched on earlier is just getting your idea off the ground and making those first steps um, to start launching your brand. And I think baby steps are okay. Starting small, starting organically is okay. And I feel like this message isn't, it's not delivered enough. And I think people are scared that they kind of have to enter a quite a high level where lo-fi content is okay. Homemade content is okay. As long as your product is, is, is a great product and I think that is kind of the key message for me um, in terms of like you can start with a small budget I often hear people like chucking around numbers you need 50k to start brand you need 100k and I just if you're happy to start small I had a budget of 1500 and I was able to start this brand start organically and build from there and I think in terms of content, people don't need over-polished content on their Instagram. They want stuff they can relate to. Um, and, and yeah, so I'm just a champion of small brands and I think everyone can do it. If you put your mind to it. <laughs> I think that's really good advice to for somebody to hear actually that you don't need to start with a really huge budget and you can still become a Peachy Dan or a Daphne without having x amount of money i think that's a really good piece of advice girls thank you so much thank you so much